and welcome to Flourishing Philosophy. Today I want to talk to you about attention, both in the work of Iris Murdoch and in how that might apply to some of us who are not necessarily very good at paying attention. So Iris Murdoch wrote about attention, particularly in her work The Sovereignty of Good and in an essay in that called The Idea of P Perfection. And in there she says, I've used the word attention, which I borrow from Simone Weil, to express the idea of a just and loving gaze directed upon an individual reality. And she says, I believe this to be the characteristic and proper mark of the active moral agent. Now, this is interesting because most of the moral philosophy that we come across is all about action. So it's about, oh, you're in this big, scary situation where you've got this horrendous choice to make. Uh, do you carry on along the train line and kill five people or do you flip the switch and kill just one? And Murdoch is moving us away from what she calls those moments of choice towards thinking more about the moral agent and what's going on in their view of the world, in their vision of the world. So for her, um, the moral life has a lot to do with uh, a particular way of seeing. And this is where attention comes in. So she thinks that we can often be sort of... Uh, distracted, wrapped up in our own selfish desires, in our own projects, in our own visions of the world. And that can distort our view of what's in front of us. So we really need to work on paying attention to stuff, on casting this just and loving gaze, in order to see things how they really are, rather than distorting them to fit our picture of things. So this is the mark of the moral agent. Not because what we do doesn't matter. Um, she certainly thinks that the way that we behave is important. But everything that we do has its genesis in uh, our vision of stuff. So that's great. And uh, I've been thinking about that on and off for about a decade now since I first came across it. And over the past couple of years, I've been working as part of a brilliant project called In Parenthesis, which explores the work of Iris Murdoch, along with her Oxford contemporaries, Mary Midgley, Philippa Foote and Elizabeth Anscombe. So I've, I've been thinking about this stuff quite a lot for quite a long time. But it's only recently that it dawned on me that actually maybe this has some more personal implications for me. So I've often heard it joked that moral philosophers will often take an interest in the stuff that they're really bad at. So the person who is interested in the virtue of courage is the one who's going to run away in the face of danger. Maybe people who are interested in the philosophy of charity are particularly mean-minded and stingy or whatever. Now, I don't know if there's a lot of truth in that, but it dawned on me that maybe it's true about me. So, attention has always been a difficulty that I've had. I was that kid that had the school report that said, oh, well, she could be really bright if only she paid more attention. I was terrible at sport at school. Now, that's partly because I'm long-sighted in one eye and short-sighted in the other. So I had no idea how quickly that tennis ball was hurtling towards me. But it's also because very often we were outside when we were being instructed. And the teacher was trying to explain the rules of rounders or whatever to us. But uh, I could hear the wind rustling in those beautiful poplar trees or there were some birds flying overhead making really pretty patterns in the sky. And by the time I realised that I'd been spending five minutes gazing at those and not listening to what I was supposed to be listening to, the explanation was over, we were all running out onto the field and I had no clue what on earth I was supposed to be doing. 
and that's that's carried on so um, I have uh, have to make a very conscious effort to keep my house at all tidy because I just don't notice the mess piling up until it's suddenly horrendous um, similarly laundry um, bills anything like that um, so I've learned a number of coping strategies uh, lots of list making and so on and I'm also now on a waiting list to be assessed for ADHD um, at the grand age of 13 um, so I don't know whether um, I actually have a clinical condition or not, but attention is certainly not my strong point. But I got to thinking about what does that have to do with Iris Murdoch's view of attention? So if Murdoch thinks that attention is this important mark of the active moral agent, and I'm really bad at it. Does that mean that I'm going to be really bad at being moral? And what do we say about people who have really, really severe difficulties with attention? So people with serious ADHD who require a hell of a lot of help. Do we say that, uh, that in some way they are seriously hindered from living a good or flourishing moral life i think that could be that could be a real problem so one thing we might think there is well maybe this is just the same word but it's a total coincidence and the sense of attention being used when we're talking about the clinical condition has absolutely nothing to do with the sense of attention that's being used in Murdoch's moral philosophy and in Simone Weil and elsewhere. Well, I think they might be being used slightly differently, um, although this is terribly complex because there's a lot of argument over what it is that Murdoch actually means. But certainly um, somebody who has difficulty with attention might well find themselves wrapped up in their own thoughts or ideas they might find themselves sort of leaping ahead with their theory of something before they've heard everything that somebody has to say and paying attention in that way can be really really tricky so yeah maybe I'm a bit screwed morally speaking maybe that's a, a serious difficulty for me but I think there there might be some redeeming things here so for one thing, we live in a world where there are lots of things competing for our attention. Um, and a lot of that comes from our employers. So there's this drive to be ultra focused on your work, to constantly check the bottom line, profits above all else and so on. And I think I'm particularly resistant to that, not because I have uh, cultivated some uh, fabulous kind of ultra-conscious resistance, but just because I cannot focus on that for the life of me. I'm just not very good at it. So maybe one blessing of this is that um, my attention is less likely to be grabbed by certain things that it shouldn't be grabbed by. Another thing um, to think about is um, what gets described as hyper-focus in people with ADHD. And whether I have the condition or not, I certainly have a version of this. So before my son was born, I uh, used to struggle enormously when I was starting a piece of academic research. I would laboriously fight my way through books and articles trying for the life of me to stay focused on it. I'd use, use timers, use all kinds of rewards and strategies to keep myself focused. But once it got to a certain point, some idea, some interesting little thought would grab me and then I would be utterly engrossed. I would dive right in and I could spend days and nights just solidly working on that piece and everything else was just shut out. So there is a potential 
for a lot of people who have maybe difficulties regulating their attention to pay perhaps more attention to something, to be ultra focused on it in a way that other people might not be. And that can include um, focusing on the natural world, focusing on a lot of things that are outside of ourselves. So then you are doing what Murdoch describes as unselfing, perhaps, which is moving your focus of attention outside yourself onto something else. And this is a really important thing to cultivate, ethically speaking. The final thing that I wanted to say is that uh, people who have difficulties with regulating attention typically develop a hell of a lot of strategies to do it. So whether it's reminders, list making or whatever, um, there's all of that. Um, one thing that uh, happened in my case was when I was a kid, I used to have the most appalling scruffy handwriting. It was just the absolute worst. Um, and I got sick of it in the end because I kept getting my homework sent back for me to rewrite and uh, I was spending a lot of time doing that. And so I thought, well, how can I work on my handwriting and turn this into something that I want to do? So I was always very into art and craft. So I started teaching myself calligraphy learning the techniques for that and then trying to write as much as possible with a calligraphy pen to kind of inculcate certain habits of writing with my hands. And I spent about a year doing this and after that my handwriting was completely transformed. I've got quite pretty handwriting these days. So uh, that's habit building and a lot of people with attention difficulties need to work on this and have worked on this. I've done it more recently with housekeeping and tidiness and all of that. So it's to do with finding strategies that will absorb you in stuff that hadn't absorbed you before. And these are the kinds of things that might be useful to anybody who is trying to cultivate the virtue of attention. So if you're trying to shift your vision, see the world differently and start thinking in different ways and acting in different ways as a consequence of it, you need to shift your habits of living. And it may be that by looking at the strategies employed by people who absolutely have to work on this stuff consciously because attention is very hard for them, might actually help everybody to improve in terms of the virtue of attention. So I haven't really worked on this, these are just a few thoughts, but hopefully it will give you something to mull over and I hope to see you again at Flourishing Philosophy. Bye!